This is Minnesota's political postgame show. The Late Debate with Jack Tomzak and Benjamin Cruzy on the Tea Party Radio Network. Good evening, Late Debaters. Sorry for the late start. Good evening, Ben. Good evening. Yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. Don't worry about it. All right. All right, let's uh, get to our phone interview right away. We've got Alan Quist. He's running for Congress in the 1st District, running for endorsement at this point. Alan, are you with us? I, I am with you, Ben. This is Jack. Well, this is Jack. I'm yeah, with Jack. you, Ben and Jack. Yes. I'm here. Outstanding. So, Alan, <laughs> uh, you ran for endorsement two years ago, running for endorsement this year. Uh, right. How are things looking? Well, we think they're looking very good. All right. Are, uh, uh, what should we say? Cautiously optimistic. Outstanding. Now, when is your endorsing convention? It's coming up the 19th of April, so it's coming up now in a couple of weeks. All right. Now, let's, uh, I'm aware of your history, but let's give uh, some of the listeners, some of the younger folk who may not be aware of your history in uh, Minnesota politics and public service. Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, I began my career as a teacher at Bethany College, and, uh, and in 1982 I was uh, recruited by some neighbors to run for the legislature in the Minnesota House, and uh, I was elected to that, represented St. Peter, Lesur, and some of the surrounding North Mankato some of the surrounding uh, rural areas and smaller towns, Nicollet, uh, places like that, uh, served three terms in the Minnesota House. And, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Democrats didn't like me a lot when, when I was That's there. a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And there are two reasons why they didn't like me. One is, believe it or not, uh, I and another rep by the name of Ray Welker, instead of going out and whining and dining, uh, we sat in his office or mine and we read the bills. And... Uh, what a and novel idea. That. Yeah. <laughs> so the bills would come up on the floor, and we knew the bills better than the Democrats did. The Democrats were in control the first two years I was there, and then we were in control two years, and then, unfortunately, uh, the Democrats were in control again. Um, but then in 94, I was uh, once again drafted, this time by statewide Republican activists, uh, to oppose uh, then-Governor Ernie Carlson, Carlson, who called himself a Republican, but uh, a lot of us knew better, mm-hmm. and um, as you know, he became one of the staunch uh, supporters of Barack Obama, so that yeah. uh, pretty much tells the world uh, where he was coming from. And, and in 94, uh, that was uh, you were endorsed over a sitting governor. That is uh, that, that's, that's, that's pretty correct. impressive. <laughs> that's, I got 70% of the, of the vote on the first ballot. Wow. Yeah. So that that tells people, uh, you know, that the Republican activists are obviously like me better than mm-hmm. Arnie Carlson, but that's not saying much. <laughs> 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 so, uh, but uh, Carlson, of course, was committed to going to a primary, and Minnesota mm-hmm. has that open primary, so mm-hmm. the Democrats all crossed over and voted for Carlson. I sure. mean, of course, they loved him. Yep. And so why not? So anyway, uh, that's how that went. And then... Uh, Two years ago, I once again was asked by Republican activists out here in southern Minnesota to run for First District Congress. There were four of us running, and uh, I came in second uh, for endorsement, so I dropped out. Um, and uh, then I thought I probably would not run uh, this time, but here we go again. again uh, you know, a number of Republican activists uh, in- encouraged me uh, to run. And, uh, so I always listen to people. I don't always agree, but uh, I decided to give it a shot because uh, I don't like sitting back while our country is being destroyed. Well, Alan, anytime somebody asks me to run for office, I tend to agree with them. <laughs> now, uh, I, worked, yeah. uh, I worked for your wife, Julie, when I was at Congressman yeah. Bachman's office, and, um, and she is no, no stranger to me asking for uh, uh, stories of political history in this state. So let me ask you, do you are, are there parallels to the 90s and uh you know the republican takeover over of congress in 94 the the time that you were uh, that you ran for governor mm-hmm. are there parallels uh from then to now are we going through the same I, thing is this similar well a- absolutely and i would say there are clear parallels to 1980 with the republican revolution okay um and maybe that's where the parallels are clearer because in 1980 uh, a lot of individuals who had not thought of themselves as republicans uh, saw who Ronald Reagan was and really supported him, uh, believed in him, and said, if Reagan's a Republican, then I am one too. And so there was a huge influx of new people into the party uh, at that time. And uh, in 94, I would say that happened 
uh, once again, and it is clearly happening uh, today. Just as an example, on caucus night, I was in Rochester, Olmsted County, uh, trying to welp- welcome people as they came into Mayo High School, and uh, there are over a thousand people that came in the caucus at, at Mayo High School, and my guess is about half of them had never been to a caucus before. Wow. So people realize our country is being dismantled in front of our eyes, and they're coming out of the woodwork, and uh, the new people aren't Democrats. The new people are Republicans, and they're conservative Republicans. Yeah. Now, I was two in 1980, so I don't, of course, have any uh, uh, firsthand knowledge of this, but it seems mm-hmm. that in Barack Obama we have the, the, the Jimmy Carter in this play. But mm-hmm. do we have the Ronald Reagan? Um, I don't believe so. Okay. But um, we have the Al Quist, so hey, we're in good shape. You know, I, I, I think that'll work out just fine. So let's, uh, uh, I'll give you an e- easy softball. What's wrong with Tim Walls? Um, well, it's, uh, you know, it's the question, what's wrong with Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama? They're all yeah. three peas in a pod, and uh, they believe in the same things. They follow the same policies. They uh, support uh, the same things, and what they're supporting is destroying our country. So... Um, that's kind of the long and short of it. Now, does does Walls present himself as as the liberal that he is and how he votes? Does he present that to the voters of the first district, or do they think he's just some nice teacher who is a veteran and kind of conservative like like we all are? Well, he you know he got away with uh, trying to present himself as a centrist for a while, but that game is over. Uh, his support for Obamacare and then his support for cap and trade. I mean, cap and trade is a radical bill. Absolutely. And, um, and then his um, being uh, supportive of, of Nancy Pelosi, who's not uh, Mrs. Popular in Minnesota, <laughs> uh, he pretty well has identified uh, him for who he is. And, and as an example of that, I'm confident that he will not dare have a, a legitimate town hall meeting this summer because he'll run into a buzzsaw, mm-hmm. and uh, he just, uh, he, you know, he can't face that. Did he have town hall meetings when Obamacare was moving through Congress? Well, he tried, and uh, unfortunately for him, people came and, and told him what they thought, and uh, it was just too much of an embarrassment, and so he uh, he stopped having genuine town hall meetings and would only have some highly controlled, uh, I would say, put it this way, uh, Invitation only mm-hmm. uh, type meetings, but the general public couldn't get in and say anything. All right, now let's talk about those two uh, horrible votes that Congressman Walls took: Obamacare and cap and trade. Uh, and mm-hmm. we have a two-hour show, Alan. So, <laughs> and I know you know the, this stuff. Let's talk about. Let's first let's talk about Obamacare. I noticed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember which news outlet it was, but they they fact checked one of your statements about right. ma- married couples paying more under Obamacare. Right. And found that that was accurate. So let's start there. Uh, what, what's what's wrong with Obamacare? Tim Walz is uh, the bill that he supported, and how is it going to affect the Congressional mm-hmm. District 1 voters? Um, well, let me start with the overall question of what's wrong with it. It has the government running our lives. Uh, there you go. In, instead of our... Done, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a freedom issue. And, uh, you know, let's take this matter of, for instance, uh, uh, HHS telling the Catholic Church that it has to provide... Uh, uh, contraceptives and abortifacients and so on under Obamacare. And, you know, that, that is a religious freedom issue, but more than that, it's just a freedom issue because, I mean, since when does the federal government have the right to tell us, uh, tell anybody uh, what they have to have for medical insurance or tell any business or any person what they have to provide uh, or tell anybody that they have to carry medical insurance at all? Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, in a nutshell, Obamacare is a, is, is a loss of our fundamental freedom, and uh, our lives are run by the state. And now, Alan, Alan, that, I, Alan, I think we skip yeah. over, uh, you know, oftentimes, because we all agree with, with each other, and we all kind of get our news from the same sources oftentimes, we skip over that. Now, let's, let me ask you, to be, to be clear, the, the loss of choice and freedom comes in that you're going to get only so many options in this health care exchange, and not necessarily... Now, not that we've got a free market with, with health insurance now, but certainly less free when you only have uh, so many options that the government has approved of in front of you. Is that correct? You, you only have so many options, and they're all the same. Okay. <laughs> so, so you basically don't have any options at all. I mean, under the under the exchange, the the insurance companies 
will charge what the government says they can charge and will cover what the government says they must cover and will pay what the government says they must pay and uh, will not cover whatever the death panels say they can't cover. And mm -hmm. so uh, there's no choice under the system. No. Uh, it, you know, and the Obama people and Democrats have said, well, you know, you can keep, you can keep your doctor which you probably can't, but you can keep your same insurance company. Well, what the difference does it make if all the insurance companies right. have to do exactly if what all the, the plans are the same? Yeah, it's uh, all the same. Is this the the road to a single payer system? Absolutely. And Obama has made that quite clear. Uh, his problem is that it's very very difficult to go from a free system uh, to a socialized system halfway, and that's what Obamacare tries to do. It, it is the in between step, and uh, that's one of the reasons I, why I think it's likely that the Supreme Court uh, will say the whole thing is unconstitutional because you just can't do anything halfway. I mean, you can't be halfway socialistic either. You go there or you don't. Sure. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, death panels. That is something that uh, uh, I believe that Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman mm -hmm. have gotten in trouble for saying those mm -hmm. two words together, and I don't think the word death panel is in Obamacare. But explain to the listeners. Uh, uh, the reality of, of of what the death panels are and and what it says in the bill. Sure. Well, it, I mean, a death panel is a panel uh, of appointed bureaucrats, nobody that's uh, that's going to face a voter that decides under what conditions you will be treated. And so, let me just give you as an example. Uh, you know, if you have somebody with uh, with a serious cancer that needs uh, surgery and chemo and radiation and whatever, that, and that might uh, you know, might require treatment that would cost, uh, you know, fifty to $100,000. The death panel uh, is set up to say if you're 45 years old, you can have the treatment. Uh, but if you're whatever, and they, they can determine where they put the age cutoff, uh, if you're 79, we don't think your life is worth living and worth this money, and so you cannot have the treatment. Mm -hmm. And so the death panel decides who will be treated and who won't? And in many cases, this is a life or death decision. So that, in fact, is how they're set up to operate. And I'm very willing to call them death panels because I like calling a state a state. That's yep. what they are. And, Alan, I like asking you uh, questions because I know that you've read this. So, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I one know, of the few. I know that you can back up uh, everything that you say. All right. Uh -huh. and, and I think, Alan, that Obamacare, well, let me ask you, in your experience in the first, uh, is Obamacare unpopular? Have Absolutely. people gotten the message? Okay, good. No, it's, just, it's, it's terribly unpopular, and I would say that it's more unpopular in the rural area than it is in the uh, urban area because people in rural areas tend somewhat to value their freedom more. Uh, and I wouldn't want to push that too far, but mm -hmm. there's somewhat of a tendency to be more uh, freedom-oriented and be uh, unwilling to have other people, especially the government, run our lives. That is why uh, rural people seek out rural lives. In my opinion, yeah. what? <laughs> and I'm and I'm a rural person. The last time you went so home, really. you just sat uh, you sat there with your wife, going, "Let's just do this. Let's, let's just get out of the city. Here. Let's just stay in the nowhere." Yeah. So uh, let's talk about uh, cap and trade. Mm -hmm. That that is a vote he took. He should be held accountable to that. Right. Explain it. Um, well, cap and trade essentially. Uh, it, uh, let me put it this way: cap means that uh, the government. Uh, sets a limit or a cap on how much carbon dioxide can be emitted in a country, in a state, by a business, uh, you know, and all the way down the line. Um, and, you know, and the fact of the matter is, if you know, any, if you know chemistry 101, I don't uh, touch. then a person knows that you can't burn fossil fuels without giving off carbon dioxide because right. carbon plus oxygen allows you to burn something, mm -hmm. and that gives off carbon dioxide. So... Um, so you can't do anything. I mean, you can't have energy, uh, for the most part, uh, with fossil fuel without carbon dioxide. So it forces countries, uh, because of the limits or caps on carbon dioxide, to buy what are called carbon credits, which are allocated to third world countries, uh, you know, like South Africa, as, as an example. Uh, and South Africa will get far more carbon credits under the system than it uses. So the United States is forced to buy carbon credits. Uh, from South Africa in order to have energy. So all it is is a huge income transfer system from the United States, especially in the EU, 
uh, to third world countries. And of course, all the third world countries voted for the stupid thing because <laughs> they're, uh, I mean, 